Okay, we are live. Great. We are live. Wonderful. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Fred Munch. I'm really grateful to be here. I'm the president of the Partnership to End Addiction, and I'm so happy to moderate this wonderful panel of experts today uh, with our team from the partnership. Uh, very briefly about who we are. The Partnership to End Addiction is a merger between the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse and the Partnership for Drug-Free America slash Kids. And these two organizations have nearly 60 years of combined experience, and there's one common theme, and the, it's been the focus on families, concerns, significant others, and loved ones. And our organization, really, there are four pillars. Those pillars are advocacy and policy, media and culture change so families know they can make a difference, research and technical assistance to providers, and a couple of really great grants we've just got. One is we are the family-based addiction organization to lead the Family Center of Excellence um, from SAMHSA that just came out. And one of our researchers, Aaron Hogue, who's leading so much of our family research and is an expert in the field, um, he just got a great NIDA grant where we're going to be uh, developing a recovery-based research center for families. Um, and in addition to that, many of you know our tangible tools. So we have the multi-channel telehealth national helpline. We have online support services. Uh, we have self-guided e-learning. We have mobile programs. Um, we have lots to hold family members' hands on the journey. And as many of you know, um, you know, we've seen a significant growth in behavioral health and addiction tech in the last 10 years. It's rapidly grown. And this has certainly been propelled by COVID, right? I mean, when you look at it, people are realizing uh, tech is not the boogeyman. So it's not just the early adopters. Um, we know now that it has pros and cons over traditional in-person care. And we know that traditional in-person care has pros and cons over tech-based care. And the goal is to leverage the strengths of both. Um, but even as we look at the growth of tech, it's been largely relegated to provider-based systems. It's been largely relegated to direct to the individual struggling, and families have been left out of the picture. They've been left out of innovation. And, you know, really, we know that when we look out at the landscape, that's not the case in the general health space, right? Families are a part of the equation. Uh, uh, you know, if you look at uh, uh, traditional services for elder care, right, there's tons of applications that bring families together to support the individual struggling. Um, in the addiction and behavioral health space, uh, not necessarily directly related to tech, but we know that when families are engaged, either the loved one is trained directly without the person struggling, or in family-based interventions, that outcomes are better. You're more likely to go to treatment, you're more likely to recover, and outcomes are more likely to be better. The other sort of unanticipated benefit of that is stigma starts to reduce. People start to come out of the shadows and we create united recovery. Um, so, you know, as we think of behavioral health and tech, um, we're so excited to have this panel. And as we bring families in, we can start to shift that uh, uh, focus on the individual. Um, and when we shift that focus, we can shift the stigma, we can shift the conflict of families, we can shift the systemic barriers, is one, which is one of the reasons families are not engaged. Unlike in-person sessions, you can engage families with technologies. There's great options for family members to think about it. You don't have to go to treatment. There's no reimbursement issues the way there is for in-person care. It allows for distancing or it allows for full engagement and it allows for support. So there's so much more to be covered here today and we're so excited to have this amazing, amazing panel today. And before we get started, just want to, Aura is gonna go over some housekeeping and then the panel will introduce themselves. Thank you again, everyone for joining. Thank you so much for that uh, that overview, Fred. Um, just as Fred spoke, uh, uh, myself, Ara, and Fred will be moderating the main part of the panel, and my colleagues Amber and Jack will be leading the Q and A discussion. Um, so just to go over some quick reminders, I know by now everyone's an expert in Zoom, being the current state of the situation. Um, so just some reminders: uh, continue to share any questions you have in the Q and A 
section. Um, both Jack and Amber will be moderating that section and will be asking your questions towards the end of the panel. Uh, we will not be using the raise hand feature that Zoom has. And also this uh, panel will be recorded and also published online um, in case you have to leave early. And also there's some resources at the end of this PowerPoint, which will be posted in the chat as well. Um, and also a brief survey will be shared, which you can complete at either the end of the panel or um, a, it will be sent via link um, through the email. Um, so to get started, the first uh, for one of our first panelists is Christine Storm. She's the Director of Community Education at Care and Treatment. Right. Thank you, Aura. I really appreciate that. Um, and thanks to the partnership for allowing me to be a part of this panel today. I love you guys and what you do and am constantly sending families your way. Um, so I'm Christine. I'm uh, the Director of Community Education at Karen. And for those who aren't familiar with Karen, um, Karen's one of the oldest and largest addiction treatment centers in the country. We're a not-for-profit, been around since 1957. Um, our main campus is in Pennsylvania. And there we treat teens through older adults with substance use disorder and other behavioral health conditions. Um, and then we also have centers in Florida. We've got Karen Ocean Drive and Karen Renaissance where we treat adults. Um, and in every aspect of what we do, families are included. Uh, we have um, some regional recovery centers in major East Coast cities where we do a lot of family support and alumni support. Those are in uh, DC, New York, uh, Philadelphia, and Atlanta. Um, I work in Karen's prevention department. So we're one of the largest departments at Karen and we've been around since 1990. I've been there since 2004. And um, our department is, like I said, largely focused on prevention, early intervention and supporting um, youth K through 12 um, in, in any spectrum of addiction, you know, prevention all the way through to recovery. Um, and one thing that we're really excited about is just that we've been able throughout this time um, of, of COVID and, um, you know, distance, social distancing to be able to take all of our programs that we've been doing for many, many years and adapt them to meet the needs of where people are right now. Um, so I'm somebody that, that you know, I, I personally don't think that, that um, there's any sort of replacement for that face-to-face, in-person, hand-holding, that really human connection, there's absolutely a place and a space for, for all of these different services. And um, like Fred had said, there's pros and cons to both. Um, so embracing all that this virtual and digital space has to offer has really allowed us to meet more people where they're at and to reduce some of those barriers that sometimes happen with in-person programming. Um, so you can show the next slide if you want. This is just a a uh, little overview of some of the things that, that we have right now to be able to support families uh, throughout the journey from prevention all the way through to recovery. Um, so some of the things that I'll be able to address today are related to digital learning courses um, that are free and accessible to anybody um, for a variety of different topics. Videos, webinar recordings, podcasts, apps. Um, so all of these different things and I look forward to discussing them today. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Hi all, do you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my name is Amit. Thank you for uh, taking the time and uh, joining us in, in, in hearing uh, our discussion in the panel. Um, I have a hybrid uh, background combining practice as a clinical psychologist, research within the academy and experience in the ITEC industry. I'm a past ITEC entrepreneur and I have consulted to a large number of companies, mostly in areas of product design and uh, analytics, user analytics. I am particularly interested in the research and development of digital interventions that change the world, meaning interventions that work in the real world outside of uh, laboratory settings. Um, right now, I direct the Digital Intervention Psychology Lab at the University of Haifa at Israel. You can hear from my accent that I'm not a native English speaker. And, and when we examine how people use digital interventions in the real world, we see that they are not engaged as we assume them to be. And my work focuses on three areas where I believe the most impact lies within. 
uh, product design, I develop scales and principles that address this domain. MindTools.io is a website that I co-founded with uh, Dr. John Kane. And uh, in this website, I discuss some of these design principles and uh, presents mental health uh, and addiction related app reviews. Uh, user psychology, realizing that the same person acts differently when we meet them face to face versus when we meet them online or remotely or when we use self-guided interventions and how this should impact intervention design. And last but not least, uh, technology in the service of humane connections. Uh, in my work, I have learned that people like to use technology somewhat as an infrastructure that helps them better connect, relate uh, to their loved ones or other people they care about. And I think it does so much better than helping people support themselves. Uh, and I worked on several projects in this area um, from uh, helping teaching volunteers how to support people with mental illness, uh, involving in, uh, be, I've been involved in several projects that Fred Munch uh, leads with regard to substance uh, use. And uh, currently I'm working on a digital parent training intervention uh, aimed at uh, helping parents overcome their child destructive behaviors. Uh, it involves questions that you can relate to uh, around how can we help one person, a guardian if you will, support another person and themselves when they do not have 100% control of everything around them. Uh, that's about it. Thank you. I'd like to thank the partnership for inviting me and looking forward to having a fruitful discussion. Thank you, Amit. Hi, everybody. Um, so grateful for this webinar. Um, even more grateful um, when we can bring that family voice um, to the table. So. Um, not that researcher or technologist, or um, but just bringing the family voice. Um, I've been at the partnership for about uh, 10 years between volunteer and working there, and I work on both the family services team and advocacy team. But I think the most critical role and what I'm so grateful for is that I can be that voice of families. Um, part of my job is um, talking with families every day, right? And figuring out where those gaps are, um, how do we navigate that treatment system, um, how do we navigate, you know, the denial system when we're denied an insurance, um, what are those barriers um, that are faced every day. Um, we talk about the, stain, the shame and, and judgment and stigma and, um, you know, it's almost like a game of shoots and ladders, you know, it's just that constant, you know, up and down. Um, and what that brings, what that helps me do is to help inform these programs um, that we see on the screen. And um, I'm so grateful to the partnership because, you know, many times it's, um, and Fred, I'm sorry about this, the executive teams, right? And those leaders that make the decisions, um, they listen to these families and really um, understand um, their journey. They understand the many different touch points of that journey, right? And they also understand um, that there's no one size fits all and that, you know, families don't even, don't only need support today, but they need solution-based support. And um, so I will speak a little bit to some of the services we currently have at um, our helpline. Um, we are we currently get close to 1,500 communications a month now, of families calling in um, from um, a large spectrum. It could be that person um, uh, struggling um, maybe are just experimenting, my apologies, um, with marijuana to, you know, our fam our son or daughter or granddaughter just overdosed. Um, this is that first touch point. Um, and they come to us in many different ways. Um, they We understand um, some of the culture and how families work. So we know grandparents, right? We know they hate technology and they want to use their phones. We understand that some of our marginalized communities need, are coming through Facebook, right? And they're not going to call. Um, and so that's our first touch point. And, and most of the time, um, the first time that fa a family has spoken to someone who hasn't um, shamed or judged them um, and gave them a safe place to share. Um, our website, I, you know, I can't say enough, um, the meat and depth of resources there. Um, uh, is is not only free, 
but again, every touch point, you know, what does it look like? What are the questions I ask when I'm looking for treatment? How, um, how can I navigate, um, you know, uh, this, the broken system that the families face uh, at every curve? And, and there's so many of them. Um, help and hope by text, uh, lifeline, beacon of hope for families, right? Um, so many families might not have that courage or that window hasn't opened yet where they're ready to reach out for help. Um, this is a platform, whether it's early use, um, opioids, prevention, um, early recovery, where we connect with that person and, and serve up tailor um, messages to them based on an assessment. Um, and from there, um, offer a wealth of information and services. You know, when that small window opens, that small opportunity, they can reach out to us. Um, E-learning, just some self-paced courses, um, mostly on prevention or maybe that, um, you know, uh, that first touch point on the journey when you think your loved one might be struggling. Uh, peer power coaching, I'll probably speak to this throughout the, the, um, the uh, webinar, but um, this is um, what we do best. Um, we have 350 peer um, coaches across the country um, helping families one-on-one -on -one at no cost um, and really with a solution-based model uh, driven by Craft and MI and ACT. Um, our online support community is, um, if you think of that traditional uh, support group like an Al-Anon, uh, very similar format, but we serve up solutions and topic-based. Um, and um, this has been a lifeline, uh, especially in the last six months. So we could speak for further on this uh, as we move forward. And thank you again. Thank you Thank so much. You, Denise. Mm -hmm. uh, next up is uh, David Gastrand. He's the co-founder of Diana Care Health. Thank you. Um, I want to thank um, the whole team at the partnership and uh, Fred Munch for your, your leadership um, and everybody for attending. It's nice to have a big crowd on a Zoom call like this. Um, we got into this work because I'm an addiction psychiatrist and I spent 25 years at Harvard Medical School um, conducting research, but we also have multiple family members who went through rehab and um, relapse and rehab and relapse. And um, my oldest son was really distressed by this and said, why aren't there solutions um, that stop this revolving door? And I said, actually, we have some amazing evidence-based solutions and nobody uses them. And he was shocked and wanted to know why. And I told him the obstacles and he said, don't your people realize that with technology, you can overcome all of those obstacles. And I said, what are you talking about? And this is what resulted from literally from that discussion. So Dynamic Care tries to produce comprehensive, round the clock, 365 days a year solutions for families, all those times in between the weekly counseling sessions and to do it for a year and beyond because it takes that duration of abstinence to achieve good long-term recovery. And so this is a digital coaching program to quit. And if somebody's not ready to quit, we're okay with starting with harm reduction um, because we can get people to quit through initiation with harm reduction. And we can do this from drugs, including opioids and with alcohol and with nicotine. Um, we do it by motivating and helping people maintain accountability to themselves. So it starts with a family member signing up that they want their loved one to get help with our program. And our certified recovery coach reaches out to the person with the problem. It could be a son, it could be a spouse, it could be a sibling. And the coach talks to them by phone and assesses their needs. We use formal structured interviewing to triage and determine what would be a good match for a peer recovery coach. We then, with their agreement, ship them testing equipment and a debit card, a smart debit card. And I'll tell you why we use that. And we orient them and they download the app, dynamiccarehealth.com, onto their phone from the app store. And they do weekly check-ins with literally a FaceTime-like video right in the phone and then they also do unlimited texting with their coach. And we do this for 12 months and beyond so that this is a longitudinal program. So what's the platform? What is the technology? And the next slide shows that there are a number of evidence-based components. 
Um, in the upper right hand corner, you see we start with certified recovery coaching peers who have lived experience in recovery. Maybe they have also been on MAT, medication assisted treatment. Maybe they've been through rehab and relapse multiple times. And then we do regular, frequent drug testing, breathalyzer, alcohol testing, smokerlyzer testing, even for vaping. And we do that with pocket sized testing equipment that we ship to the individual. And that member of our, of our program actually tests themselves, but we do it with video selfie monitoring. So we see it's them, they're doing it the right way at the right time. And that accountability is managed by the individual person. They're not going to a clinic Monday through Friday at a predictable time. It's not Thursday afternoon they get tested and then it's a long weekend like Labor Day and they think, oh, they can't test me Monday, not till Tuesday. I'm free and clear for this whole long weekend. And that's a dangerous tease to a brain that is suffering from addiction. So accountability, deterrence, and detection are greatly enhanced with this route. At the bottom, you see appointment tracking. We help people schedule their appointments, even AA meetings, and then we remind them through the app. We even provide the Google Maps directions, and then we track with GPS. And electronically, if it's a virtual meeting, are they there at the right place, on time, for the right duration? Um, and then we provide CBT content, cognitive behavioral therapy. And we have over 90 modules of different topics like triggers and denial and during COVID loneliness and boredom. And these are very popular. We get very high rates of people doing this material on their phone. We can detect how long even they're reading it. And then we provide family services. We have certified family partners to support the family members. All of this is tied together at the Brain Reward Center through financial incentives, paying actual money to the person with the addiction. We are literally switching their brain's instant gratification for drugs to instant gratification for healthy behaviors. And actually over time, we switch them to healthy gratification from natural rewards in the real world. So the next slide shows what it looks like. You actually see as a family member, a portal on the left where you can follow your loved one's progress through an easy to use online dashboard. And this is all you know, consented and voluntary, but it's a way for somebody who knows they're in trouble and knows they need help to get the support, the acceptance from their loved one who may you know, have been burned by the addiction, um, who may be worn out, who may be ready to give up. And instead we say, you don't have to give up. You can actually have a better window into what's happening with your loved one's recovery without hovering, without policing, and with the debit card, without risking enabling. So in the middle, you see there's this Visa card. We provide the smart debit card to your loved one so that when you're giving them money or an allowance or your spouse sharing the income of the family with them, they can only spend a given daily spending limit and you know what they need for lunch, for transportation, but they can't spend $250 in one day. They can't spend after retail store hours closed, like in the middle of the night. They can't convert credit to cash at an ATM. And they can't use this debit card at bars or liquor stores, escort services, casinos. So there are many recovery risk protections built into the card. And then we can watch what's happening in those financial transactions and use machine learning artificial intelligence to detect if they are headed towards a relapse and connect with them for an intervention before the relapse even needs to happen. And for the family members, we provide, as Denise mentioned, a craft course. It's an online video course um, with this evidence-based family community reinforcement approach for one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, group meetings, to teach families how to cope, how to help, and um, how to be there around the clock when a clinic or a rehab can't be there. So that's the program we've tried to develop and we've completed three clinical trials um, in drugs, alcohol, and nicotine where we've shown a doubling to a tripling of the abstinence rates when people add this to conventional treatment.
Great, thanks so much, David. And thanks so much, everybody. As you can see, we really have this diverse panel with, with varied interdisciplinary expertise. And having that allows us to really think of this from multiple perspectives, and that's what we have to do from someone with lived experience, from a researcher, for someone in a traditional treatment pro program who's using technology, as well as someone who's in a startup using technology as the primary source of care uh, that can be an adjunct or standalone. As you were all talking, a few themes emerged, um, and those themes both uh, center, those themes center around the family and engagement and how to engage the family and what you're doing, you're touching on it, and then that journey, what you're doing to you know, keep the family engaged, because we know the families are the first, second, third responders, families are always there, um, and that was certainly encapsulated with David's presentation and talking about it. So as a general question for all panelists, and we can use the same order, how are you using technology to engage families who are overwhelmed by stigma, fear, and what do you see as some of the pros and opportunities to use technology to engage individuals in that first point of contact? If, if anyone else wants to jump in, please do so. Otherwise, I'll get started. Um, so I know that, that I mentioned before that my job is more in the prevention space at Karen. I can certainly speak to some of the things that we do treatment related. Um, but in the prevention space, parents are the number one influence over whether a child decides to use substances or not. Um, so we try so many angles to get parents to understand that message, to understand that they need to start having these conversations early and often and giving them advice on how to do so. Um, encouraging them um, when it's age appropriate to maybe share something around family history. Uh, I've unfortunately worked with, um, you know, not worked with, but known parents over the years who are in recovery and don't share that with their kids because they're terrified that it will make them look at them differently or that it'll give them permission to use or something. And um, that is part of a child's medical record. It's something they should know. Just like if you're, if you're, you have breast cancer that runs in your family, you would tell your daughter that so that she would be on higher alert. So we try so much at Karen to talk about this from a disease model and to get rid of that whole moral failing or um, lack of willpower that, that so many people buy into when it comes to substance use disorders. So we're always trying to figure out how do we get in front of parents and get ahead of this before it starts. And it's sometimes a struggle because sometimes people don't lean into this until there's an issue, right? Until they have been in their child's room and possibly discovered vaping devices. Um, and one of the things that I kind of love about how things have, have had to go as a result of COVID is that in the past, a lot of our prevention education was done in person, in the evening, in some sort of school-sponsored parent event night. Parents would come out. And because of issues related to being able to get there when you've got dinner to put on the table and sports and all sorts of other practices that you have to get kids to, and then sometimes off also, and I don't see this as much as I used to, but parents being afraid that if I show up in person to something like that, people might think that there's something going on at home, right? And we have to keep that private. But with us having um, prevention tools now that are digital and available anytime, any place, people can access them when it works for them. They can take some um, modules, like we have this digital learning course called PrEP. And it's fantastic. It's got you know information from you guys and NIDA. It goes into the science of addiction as a brain disease, how um, risk and protective factors. It helps parents to understand that you might be raising three kids and all three of them might have different risk factors, not so much environmentally, but internally. Um, and helps them to, to boost ways to, to work on resilience with kids and to have those tough conversations and then get help when needed. So they can access this when it makes sense for them. And then there's you know, helplines and, and opportunities to give a call to somebody if you're like, this sparked something and I need to talk about it, right? So that's what I'm thinking of from the prevention space. We'll let somebody else jump in to, to talk about their side. Thank you, Christine. And it's, a, it's just a great point that where someone is on the continuum 
engagement in not in tech, but engagement in general varies dramatically. Uh, when there's no smoke, you know, it's like selling our friends says it's like selling snowblowers in Florida. It's a different type of sale when in the prevention versus the intervention um, stage. Others? So I thought we were going in order, but I'll uh, I'll speak to that a little bit. So again, you know, I'm going to put the family hat on. Um, and um, what I didn't share before is, you know, I'm one of those families that probably um, touched every one of those touch points and barriers and um, and the shame and judgment. And so for us to stay engaged with families, you know, we talked about all our services, but for us, it's really meeting them where they are at. Um, bringing them in and knowing they are part of the solution. Um, and we share with them just, you know, they're, it's almost like a waterfall effect, right? Everything we're teaching them through our programs, it's we're helping them help their family member. Um, and so what that means, it could be just, you know, having a conversation without conflict. It could be, um, you know, learning new communication skills. It could be that mom and dad or aunt and uncle just being on the same page and modeling positive behaviors and um, being that role model. So I can go on and on. As far as, you know, what have we, what have we adapted to? Um, I think um, we were so blessed to have so many um, online resources um, already in place um, and um, it was a slow build because we don't like to promote ourselves but I think where we've really adapted is just not only meeting these families um, where they're at but meeting sadly um, the army of families that need help right so just um, taking that one online meeting of 10 and now it's five with 20 to 30 people in, right? And it's taking our trainings that used to be in person and now we're reaching people in rural areas. Um, we're reaching families that are too ashamed to walk in that room as Christine said, right? And, um, and maybe we're reaching that family with another resource of, you know, they're up all night, you know, and worried. And is my child or loved one gonna make it to the next day and just having, you know, that phone and that hope and help by text, right? To just help them breathe and know. Um, and so being that uh, beacon of hope, I, I would say. Um, but I think that, I think what works for us is we hear them, we understand them, um, and we make them part of, you know, helping their loved one. And in time, um, their loved one is, is listening um, and uh, really appreciates this whole different modality instead of punishing them, but listening to them and working with them. So I hope that made some sense. Thanks, Denise. And, you know, in, one of the things that strikes me about what, what you're saying and is, you know, there's great research on technology reducing stigma. Um, mm -hmm. people disclose more to computers, people, you know, and, and, you know, meet, maybe, you know, that's, that's a lot of your research on engagement and understanding mm -hmm. how people engage, um, you know, what, what is some of the research and like, what are some of the things you're doing to, to engage family members? Yes. So I, I think that, um, um, I can look generally at the phenomenon of, of what makes people engage and family engage in these kind of services. And I think it's a lot about building trust while these people are willing to see themselves through our eyes in some sort of way. So within the service, you offer them something. And when you offer this something, it comes with stigma because it comes with uh, certain definitions of what it means for them to be in a certain situation. And I think that people, it's easier for, the, for them to build this trust and to be able to reflect on themselves as, you know, we are these people or we need help if we allow them in some sort of way to find the way, you know, in very small steps towards this direction. So it means, like you mentioned about technology, I think that anonym, anonymity is a, is a real issue about reflection. Because if I, it's not really my name, it's not really me, you know, and I, and I can just stroll online and see things, it's one thing. So I can get information. This is one channel. So offer them multiple channels of way to interact and get something is really helpful at engagement because one person 
you know, they just want to get information first, you know, and they need to think about it for several days or several weeks before something else triggers in their mind. Mm -hmm. And other people, they will be willing to chat, but they will feel more comfortable to do it through text message or others through mm -hmm. a, for a phone line. And I think that all of these aspects, this is like opening the door. This is like a foot in the door where mm -hmm. they are more willing to, they trust they trust the organization that provide them these kind of aspects from the one end and on the other end they make this kind of a pathway within themselves as they conceptualize what it means for me to be a person that asks for these services yeah i can't things... thank Amit enough on that trust factor um it is the foundation of our programs working right um so so thank you for that and and i just want to add one more thing too because we're talking about technology and and part of that trust is the follow-through right we have a you know all these digital you know programs but um we want that sense of community and we're checking in um the next morning how did it feel did it feel right what can we do better um, and just making sure that so many of our resources and materials are truly meeting them where they are at so it's that trust and that system of care when we're not doing the technical piece, but inviting them in and, and that connectedness. So uh, A, thank you for that, um, bringing that up. Yeah, I wanna agree with that trust issue as well. When you have a disease like addiction that disrupts a central region of the brain, the reward center of the brain, it actually tricks the, the human behavior process into chasing drugs, which are overwhelmingly rewarding. And even when the thinking part of the brain, the cortex, the outer big gray matter of the brain is saying, I know this is a bad thing for me, and yet you, you keep going for the drug. And what's, what's happening is you're actually being caused to lie to yourself, to have trouble with honesty with yourself. And what's a family member gonna experience? Well, if, if somebody is, is actually hiding, concealing their risk and their need to change from themselves through denial, well, obviously it's gonna disrupt trust and honesty with other people, even the people closest to you. One of the things we try to do is we take the objectivity and put it in the hands of the patient. So instead of going to a clinic where they test my urine, and when I hand my urine over to my counselor at my clinic, even if I know my urine is clean, I feel dirty. I feel like I'm an addict and that's a bad feeling and I don't wanna share any of those issues with family members. When I test my blood glucose as a diabetic, I could have just eaten a big piece of chocolate cake. I will still test my blood glucose, why? Because I'm not an addict, I'm a person suffering with this disease and I wanna fight the disease. So we have to do that for people with addiction because they're suffering from an illness. And so when they test themselves, they're actually saying, okay, where do I stand? Let's deal with this. And suddenly they're in charge of that part of accountability. So when a family member sees or, or uh, a loved one sees that person doing their testing and producing a, a progressive effort over time and getting closer to abstinence and maintaining abstinence, suddenly the doubt and the dishonesty is dispelled. And that also dispels the stigma. So technology can really help put the recovery into the process for the, the person with the disease and put the honesty back into the transmission between these two parties. As David, I was talking about the, the reward process. Uh, Dynamic Care adopts something unique called the contingency management. I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about that because I think that's very interesting. Yes. Another way to manage this disease is to directly deal with the reward center. Now, the reward center deep in the brain is not available to conscious thought. So when you're addicted to substances, you can't just say, I'm going to think my way out of this because I know this is bad stuff that's happening. So it's more like a reflex. And only later do you think, well, that was bad. So what we do is we use contingencies, sanctions and rewards, the carrot and the stick, money or removing or decreasing money, small amounts. We're not paying anybody's rent with this kind of money, but 
it's enough to capture the attention. It's like points in a video game. In fact, it uses gamification and behavioral economics. So each time somebody does their testing, we're rewarding them for a successful abstinent test. Each time they do it again and again, they get more and more and more uh, income. Over time, we reinforce them less frequently. So week to week or every few weeks, but always randomly, even evenings, weekends, and holidays. And then we transition them in the coaching to, well, how about a reward from getting a job? How about a reward from getting a paycheck, getting a promotion, saving up for a down payment on a car or an apartment? or getting a relationship, the natural reinforcers in the real world that all the rest of us are driven by. And that's how you achieve recovery. Thank you, David. Um, and one of the things that it strikes is contingency management and contingencies are general, in general are often fostered by families in different ways, which is there's financial contingencies, but there's many other contingencies and the reinforcing behavior of families or non-reinforcing of uh, behaviors of families can put people in different directions. And I'm wondering uh, for everyone on the panel, like when we think about it, how are the families, how are the interventions specifically for families different? What are some of those differences? Because we know that families are often burnt out. We know there's conflictual relationships, both in terms of historical, where the individual struggling um, blames the family and vice versa, where there's, there's a lot of conflict as well, whether the family is traditional, extended, or elected families, for example. How do you, how do you build interventions for families? What are some of the, the, the thoughts on, on, on building something for a family that's very different from the individual? One of the things that I would say is um, we really focus on kind of helping to separate the, the family and what they're going through from the patient. So we very much focus on helping the family to reach their own level of recovery, to understand their own things that, that they need to work on to help them find their own support so that even if their loved one doesn't get better, they can still get better. So we help them to figure out how they can do that. Um, and allow them to focus on themselves. So many people who have loved ones um, in addiction, it's such a helpless and hopeless situation. It's draining, it's exhausting. You try and throw everything you can at it and you don't get to focus on self at all. So we do so much to really help the family member take care of themselves and, and to make sure that the family unit can stay tight despite what might be going on with their loved one. Obviously, we have a four day really intense family education program for all of our patients at Karen. It's mandatory for some, it's, it's very much advised for others, and several days of it is them just learning about substance use disorders, um, learning about and getting to be with other family members who get it, who, who can relate to things that they are dealing with, and then there's, there's a portion where they are with their loved one that's in treatment and, and they work with that. Um, one of the, we have parent family support groups at Karen that are all over the East Coast and nothing is more helpful um, to a family member than being around and with others who are there. There's no treatment professionals in the room, it's parents supporting other parents. Even just somebody saying, I get what you're going through and this is how I handled that is so much more valuable than anything we can tell them a lot of times as professionals. Um, and another really cool thing that we have uh, tech related is our parent to parent podcast. Um, and this we've had for years, um, but it's become even more important, I think, as we um, have been dealing with COVID and um, it's called My, Ch My Child and Addiction. And there's different topics each week that um, parents get on and, and talk about um, so that they can support one another. We know addiction is such an isolating disease. It can take people who need support and help more than ever and make them retreat into themselves. So we do so much with families to connect them with others and to get them out of themselves um, because we know that that support from the treatment professionals, but also their own community of people that get them, nothing, nothing's more valuable. Fred, I'd love to jump others? in on that too. You know, yeah, everyone, I, I please. Think, uh, when we speak to recovery, so many times we, we speak to the many different pathways, right? And, and it, it's the best pathway that works for you. And 
Um, and, and thank you, Christine. It sounds like you're doing some wonderful work. Um, I think what we do a little bit differently here is um, first to try to understand that um, families um, are told time after time that they're part of the problem, um, to let go, um, to disengage, and, and to go to Al-Anon. And, and that's the one size fits all um, message we get all the time. Um, and so in our programs, we do the opposite. Um, we tell our families to stay engaged, um, to lift them up, and to, and also teach them that this is not personal, right? That behaviors make sense. And, and while self-care is really important, I think until you can understand that these behaviors are, um, that they're not personal and that they don't love the drugs more than you. Um, how can they do this? I mean, these are the questions that are asked all the time. It's when that, that we help them understand those behaviors, that they embrace these tools and they um, catch them being good um, and, and reinforce positive um, rewards. And that's not a physical thing. That could be a nugget of love. I'm, I'm proud of you um, and lift you up. So for us, the self-care is a really important piece, but it's the hardest piece, right? Um, as, as family members, um, how do you define what that self-care is? You know, so for, for some parents, it's getting up and brushing their teeth that day, and that's a really big fee. And for others, it's reading a page in the book. And But for us families, the way we see it is, you know, we're being told to, and Christine, this is not you, it's just the whole world. <laughs> you know, go out, go to a movie, go to dinner. Um, we're scared our sons, daughters, and loved ones won't be there when they come back. So we talk about self-care. Um, but we do, we stay engaged um, and help lift that person up. So, um, different approach. Thanks, Denise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd, li I'd like to add, I think that both Christine and Denise, you talk about something that is very crucial and it's the idea of acceptance. And I think this is, acceptance as an issue is different when it comes to somebody who supports themselves than somebody who feel in charge or related, uh, you know, um, or in some sort of way obligated to support someone else who they really care about. And I think that when it comes to family members, a lot of the acceptance is about focusing on your own reaction and on your own behaviors, regardless if these behaviors are, you know, for you to take care of yourself or for you to, um, to help your loved ones. When you focus on, your reaction, you accept in some sort of way what you are responsible for, what, you, what is under your responsibility and what is not. And I think this is, this is very helpful and very crucial and different between family members who get interventions and people who get interventions from them, for themselves uh, as, as people with the clinical problem. Thanks, Anit. Um, and you know, one question with this is, you mentioned you're, you're, they're talking about different mediums of connecting, different opportunities to connect. And underlying this, you're talking about the different mechanism by which family members engage in the process, both for themselves and to help their loved one. I wonder if we can shift a little bit to specific technologies, opportunities to use and leverage technological capabilities to maybe foster acceptance in a different way or maybe foster different. I'm wondering, David, you know, starting out with like, are, are there certain things do, you know, that are almost tech agnostic, perhaps, that might engage a little bit more or something, uh, whether it's group messaging or whatever it might be that we, we can start to focus on the mechanisms that everyone is talking about that help families recovery. And, and anybody else always please jump in. Well, um, you know, an overarching um, principle and modality, whether you're using technology or conventional means, is motivational interviewing and motivational enhancement. So this is a, an evidence-based approach that says you meet the person with the addiction where they're at. You find out what they don't like, what's bothering them. They may not acknowledge that they have a problem with drugs, but they might acknowledge that they have a problem with the law or that they're broke or they're angry at their family for always bugging them. And motivational interviewing says, accept that as a place to begin and offer help and say, well, what could help stop your family from bugging you so much? And eventually it comes to, well, what do you have control over? If you can't change them, what can you do that you can change? 
And so that can be delivered through technology. We, we actually do that in our, uh, our tech. We design that into all the buttons and uh, messaging in our app. Um, and, and, but you can deliver that in your discussions at home. So um, that's probably the place I would start as an overarching approach. Thanks, David. Uh, Amit, I, I'd ask you a similar question as sort of some of the mechanisms or different tech that can be used to push out some of the theories that everyone's discussing. Yes, so I think that everybody are discussing uh, in this panel and, and rightfully, they talk about personalization, uh, about not, not going for the approach of one size fits all. And this is something I think is very, very important that the ability of, you know, in terms of technological affordances that we have to use adaptive tailoring and personalization. So it's about understanding where the people are at when, when we meet them, but also it's about adapting to their steps later on. And there are several things that we can do with technology that really helps with that. The first is that we can think of, in some sort of way, instead of thinking of, of, of a whole intervention, we can think about micro interventions. So even if we think about the relationships between the parents and the child, or, or, or as David mentioned before, if I, if I heard correctly, the content in the CBT that they have uh, in their app, you can think about 50 different micro interventions or 60 different sorts of very micro contents that are relevant to people and then to adjust it just in time based on, on, on what they need right now. And this is one technological ability. The other one, is that technology really enables us, if we have the right platform, to trigger the right thing at the right time. So for example, if we want to really make people engaged over time, we need to really think about novelty. If we always send things in the same way, using the same uh, content medium, people, the habituation uh, is created much faster. But technology enables us to send different stuff, different content different in different mediums. So for example, I can send somebody a video of a very known expert or a known, I don't know, basketball player saying something to them that really surprises them and then makes, makes a behavior salient in their mind. And I can there afterwards send them a text message of somebody who has been in their situation saying something else. And I think that novelty is, is a great way we can use technology to really keep people engaged over time and maybe last uh, thing that comes to my mind right now is, is the, the idea of optimizing effort. So because technology can meet people 24 seven, we always need, we, we, not always, but we should think about competing events in people's life. Uh, uh, it's not only relapse prevention, it, it can also be small things that happens in the afternoon or nighttime that are stressful for me. And if we can understand these kind of instances, we can try to make the desired behavior more salient by triggering something at the right time, triggering the right message, or in some sort of way trying to change the reward pattern of what, what people get. So we make the reward of the healthy behavior more tangible than it was before that. Uh, thank you, Amit. Um, so I'm hearing a lot of the panelists have adapted technology in some way, uh, shape, or form. Keeping that in mind with tech modalities, the traditional sense of human interaction where you're sitting in, in front of the therapist or the clinician is lost. So I'm wondering if um, you guys can speak to a little bit about the responsiveness from engaging families in this um, non-traditional setting. For example, Denise, as an advocate and someone who works with other parents using text tech-based platforms, how receptive have parents been with engaging you in this way? Sure, so if you think about, you know, um, the traditional approach, right? And if we go back to what Amit, Amit said, you know, with trusting and relationships, it doesn't look a whole lot different um, through technology because the strength is in the program behind it. Um, and so, for example, you know, if we look at our parent coach training, um, our first night is just introductions and getting to know each other and, and letting people share where they're at, right? Um, that not only gives them a safe place, 
Um, but we need to hear from them how, how, and that drives the rest of the way the class is going. Um, we're really mindful, an example right now in a training that we're having um, 17 coaches, nine families have lost their child. Um, and so just being mindful, what does, even in technology, what, we, what can we do to lessen that pain as we work together? Um, here's these wonderful parents giving back, right? And so what that might be is as we introduce a, a technical you know, exercise, just serving up, this could be triggering, right? And, and bringing them into that space. Um, when I think of you know, help and hope and engaging parents there, again, it's that, that early assessment so that they're tailor driven. Um, and sometimes um, you know, we can serve up those resources, but we also know at, you know, maybe at nighttime, we have to serve up a little hope too, right? Or maybe we serve up some holistic solutions to take that breath. Those are difficult hours. So just understanding the foundation, what this family is going through and the different times, as I said, during the day um, has not only helped us engage parents, but they keep on coming back and they stay engaged. And um, so I hope that makes sense. I, I keep on going back to where the family is at, but really important, um, especially in the technical world. Yeah, we found that um, different times of the day have all different meanings. Um, I think, Denise, there's a lot in what you just rolled out there. Um, you know, I'm thinking of a focus group I did in inner city Cincinnati with a Medicaid population and a, a, a black woman in her 50s talked about Saturday night at midnight and being bereft and craving like crazy. And this is um, somebody with a heroin addiction who's finally stable and sober on buprenorphine, on Suboxone. And, um, and she's just like going wild. She should be going to sleep and she cannot sleep. And all she's thinking about is how nobody wants to be with her and she probably feels she'll never be with anybody. And she'd normally go to her phone and Facebook, um, but for a dollar reward, she'll read some, you know, selection on this app. And she scrolls through what's, what are the topics and she sees loneliness. And so she starts reading this three minute segment on loneliness from cognitive behavioral therapy. And all of a sudden she finds tears rolling down her cheeks because somebody understands her and has been there. And now she's connected with her affect, her emotion and she doesn't feel the craving anymore. She's unhappy, she's sad, but she relaxes and, and she develops a connection to the app. And the, the people who use this and feel so individualized in how it works for them, they feel like the app, they actually say the app cares about me. Now, of course, it's, it's machinery, that's not true. But the ability to resource something that means something to you in a moment when it's very pressured, not waiting till next Wednesday when I see my counselor and then we'll talk about it. That makes a big difference. Awesome. Um, I was, uh, you know, just putting my, my hat back on in terms of what I tend to do is one aspect of, of family that we don't often think a whole lot about when we're thinking of um, maybe a patient or someone that's struggling with substance use disorder or the children that might be in their lives. Um, and we have um, a program at Karen called Kids of Promise, and that is a support group that we do um, for kindergarten, uh, I'm sorry, second grade all the way through um, senior year at different, different curriculums for different age groups, um, but it's to really support those children um, who are confused and have just, you know, they feel alone and like nobody understands and they're angry and they're guilty and every emotion under the sun. Um, and we are continuing to do our support groups in a virtual platform. And especially we've learned not just with kids, but also with adults when you're in person and, and you can get up and you can move around and you can do activities and, and you can create art together and things like that. That's very different than what you're able to accomplish behind a computer screen. There are lots of super fun, engaging things that you can do through Zoom and, and WebEx um, and different um, other technologies you can bring in. But we've realized we have to, especially when we're working with young kids, like make it smaller, right? Instead of our full day Satel children and teens program that we do for children of our patients up on campus, that would be a full day with 
breaks and lots of activities and stuff, we're doing smaller units of that over longer periods of time. Um, we are breaking them into virtual breakout sessions. We are having them use the annotation tools to, to do art related things. So you have to get creative, um, but kind of like Denise said, we really haven't changed the core of what we're doing. We're just having to think of it differently. Um, that's it. Thanks so much, Christine. I mean, you, you're talking about adaptation um, and, and thinking about being agile, which is what technology is pretty good at and what you all have, have been discussing. Um, I, I, I'm wondering, you know, with COVID and, and the, the shift that we've seen um, and, you know, uh, specifically to families, um, families are overwhelmed and burdened right now. It's hard. It's hard. We're seeing just so much and I meet you mentioned effort and burden and and sort of like you know that you, you have to optimize that uh, and it's so different for an individual I, I you know I as, as someone in recovery from heroin addiction I know it was me it was in my head I actually shut my family out in many ways they didn't really know what to do but my motivation had to shift over time and my interaction with them definitely influenced what I did but it was different because it was my life in many ways. And the effort I realized I had to put tons of effort in. With families, they have, my parents had other kids. My parents had a different relationship with me. And I'm wondering, you know, uh, it's sort of a two part question, which is one is, how do you how do, you do that? How is that differently that you do with te technology? And then second, which is, you know, when families are completely overwhelmed, they're completely overwhelmed. And you're mentioning like drips and drabs and micro interventions and, you know, little, little things that you can do to keep people engaged. And then the other is, yeah, I'm also hearing some things that might not be working, you know, some things that maybe technology can't do. And, and, and I'm wondering in this two part question to answer, however you like with either one is to, to, go into that a little bit before we dive into some of the Q&A with the panel. Because, you know, we, we don't want to have, have rose colored glasses on this. We want to really, really dive into this. Anybody? Yeah, I, I would like to jump in. I, I think that this is a great question. I, I can answer, I think, one perspective out of it. And, and technology, I think, it can solve everything. And this is something that we always have to acknowledge. So when people are overwhelmed, to me, it's very hard, difficult to imagine how a, a, an A to Z, A to Z intervention could work. Something that, you know, I'm going to solve all your problems. And if you try to build this kind of a self-guided intervention, that is not about prevention, it's about treatment and we're going to bring you to full recovery or whatever from A to Z, I think this is a huge problem. Because people, of course, it's difficult in regular times, but at these kind of times, it's even more difficult mm -hmm. because people right now need, first of all, to feel just in time relief before of everything else. And if you put things on high, on like very high pedestals, mm -hmm. they need, they, they try to climb to these pedestals and they, they get, things get worse, actually. So I think this is my, my first hunch uh, at this. So, so really keep, the in some sort of way the goals to very keep them low to, to 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 keep them to be very very rational and to be very very in some sort of way not let people jump into these kind of like very huge goals in this kind of time so just supporting just in time very small steps what you need right now i'm going to give you something and not try to build like a loan contract or something like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the limitations we found with technology is that not everybody's comfortable with technology. Um, you know, if we can get uh, the young person with a drug addiction problem to, to use the technology, no problem. They will take to it like, you know, a, a fish to water. Um, but what about the parents um, or the grandparents, uh, maybe who want to sponsor their loved one getting into this? So we found that it's not enough to just be great high tech. In fact, the more intuitive our high tech is to the young people, the less comprehensible it is to the older people. So mm -hmm. we found we had to introduce high touch, high tech um, for um, you know, parents, grandparents, for um, uh, re-entering um, criminal justice people coming into the community who might be older and have been in prison through 
uh, a stretch of the latest you know, updates in technology. Um, Native, Amer uh, Native American and Native Alaskan populations that we serve. So um, we have to have recovery coaches actually walk people through um, getting the family members to go to the app, press the buttons on the screen, see what the menu shows, what are the different screens show them, how do they check it week to week. And if you don't put a human process in there, um, a lot of that stuff can be lost to people. I just want to piggyback on this too. Um, you know, I mean, you spoke to, you know, um, setting that bar too high or dropping that big hammer, right? Um, as we think and reimagine these programs in a technical setting, it doesn't mean that although it's technical that we don't set that bar and make this something achievable so they come back, right? I think it also means reimagining what does this program look like? Our program, Parent Coaching, uh, 20 and a half hours over uh, two days and one dinner and pretty intense. Um, and so what we had to do is reimagine what does this look like in the technical world and what are the lives of all of us in, in our everyday work day, right? And to break that down into across seven, eight weeks into hour and a half sessions, right? And, and fill the remainder of that week maybe with some essay writing, right? Um, that does two things that allows them to share their thoughts and really helpful so that we know we're reaching them in what we're trying to work on. Um, so that's been um, a really positive thing, just reimagining what that might look like. I think um, one of the disadvantages um, and, and sometimes what we see in families and here in families is, uh, especially during COVID, um, you know, Fred, you mentioned um, how everything has just been exasperated. Um, and then imagine that inside a 900 square foot apartment. Um, with everyone home, um, you know, 58% of our young adults are also back home. So, so as a family, how do I juggle and find that safe space to do some of these, um, you know, participate in some of these programs? How do I do it in a mindful way that, you know, for me, I'll, I'll serve myself up as an example of my son um, in recovery, right? And not wanting to maybe, you know, hear me day and night talk about this. So, you know, do I create that satellite office in my car and being mindful of his journey and um, being mindful of the other siblings in the room um, who bring us so much love and pleasure, right? And, you know, maybe just checking in with them and saying, how was your day? So there's so many different things, but I think it's the time um, and setting that bar. So I, I'm so grateful you mentioned that and, and making this achievable and feel good because every baby step they take um, just leads to uh, more support. So. Um, so you're talking, uh, we've been talking a little bit about some of the advantage and disadvantages of technology and one being accessibility where it could serve an advantage purpose, but also be a disadvantage. Uh, working on the helpline as a helpline specialist, um, it's been evident where a lot of the services that um, are accessed through us is predominantly by the white European clients. And as an organization, we're trying to be more intentional about how we're disseminating resources and addressing the gaps with our services. So I'm wondering what is the demographic breakdown of clients who access your service, Christine and David? Um, and also keeping in mind that digital modalities provides us an opportunity to reach families where services are not accessible, right? Like some families, the parent is working multiple jobs in order to support their child going through substance use mm -hmm. or their recovery journey. Uh, so how can, I guess one of my other questions is how can technology be leveraged to address these disparities? Yeah, um, well, one of the aspects of class injustice in this country is that um, we experience it. So um, commercial insurance companies have rushed to um, do launches with our technology. Um, so that's great if you're employed or you're a dependent of somebody who's employed by a major corporation. Um, and it's taken actually a couple years before Medicaid's are willing or ready to start trying this. So now it's happening in Vermont, North Carolina, maybe uh, West Virginia, but um, we're, we're just, entering into a more diverse population. Um, and, and you do have to make adjustments. You do have to 
um, enhance your range of um, the material, um, uh, language, um, like Spanish access, um, and uh, your even your coaches, if you're matching, you have to have a diverse panel of, of staff. And that means you have to make extra effort in recruiting and you have to have you know, consideration for this in supervision. Um, even in your internal, you know, if you're a corporate entity, and I guess a nonprofit, you have to be mindful of you know, our wages and promotions and support um, for staff meeting their needs. Um, if you're uh, trying to you know, achieve you know, appropriate diversity for the population you wanna serve. And um, I, we find that you got to make an effort. And it's not, you know, obvious or just natural because of the way society um, has evolved. Wonderful. Thank you, David. And this is certainly a discussion that could be its own panel um, in terms of how we leverage technology for diverse populations, how we reach individuals, how different communities use technology, synchronous, asynchronous, how stigma affects different communities and how we can use technology. So, so thank you all. Um, thank you, um, everybody on the panel. Right now, we're going to shift to Amber and Jack, who are uh, have been taking questions from participants uh, to shift and ask some of the questions to everyone on the panel. Yeah, thank you, Fred. And uh, I do encourage anybody, if you feel comfortable, um, sharing any questions in the Q&A feature of Zoom. We're happy to kind of go through these. And I kind of wanted to start one, admit this one specifically for you. Um, and, and I loved when you were talking about micro interventions, right? I think of, you know, as my time as a clinician, you know, really working and setting up these beautiful psychodramas and like experiential, you know, moments, you know, empty chair, gestalt uh, interventions. And, you know, I think about these really major interventions that we do. And you were talking about micro interventions and slowly kind of building people um, to kind of that desired behavior change. So uh, Gina uh, Fitzgerald asked, can you share an example of a micro intervention and how would you implement it? Yeah, so my idea about micro interventions um, started, I think, three years ago no, four years ago, when I lived in the U.S. and went to visit Israel for one time, and I had this instance with a cab driver who was talking to me while I was going from one place to the other, and he said something very, very supportive that made me feel very, very good. And, uh, you know, it, it, I, I had this kind of moment, and they say, wow, this, this guy, I just talked with him, and, you know, after two minutes, I feel much better, and for, I don't know, four hours later. So... Micro-intervention is a very, very brief, it doesn't have to be, you know, several minutes, it can, it can be several days, but it's very, very brief intervention uh, that has a very concrete goal that most of the time is measured in, in very short periods of time. And, and it's based on events where each event creates something meaningful at the moment. So, for example, a micro-intervention, and, and, and I'm just using my word of right now, I'm building digital parent training program for child disruptive behaviors. So, one micro-intervention would be, so I want to foster positive interactions, right, between the parent and the kid. A micro-intervention would be to find one way for the parent to discuss good things that they had during the day at home. And this would be the whole intervention. And I offer them, you know, one of several uh, options. One of them is a gratitude exercise during dinner time. They need to have this kind of environmental cue. So this would be the intervention. And uh, so I plan the intervention beforehand. You ask, how do I do that? So I plan the intervention beforehand, you know, pen and pencil. But there are different ways to deliver these interventions. You can teach people how to do these kind of interventions even online on a web page. Uh, on a web page, just showing what, what they can do. You can teach them on YouTube. And in, in my world, they have this kind of platform that is open source that I'm using to, to deliver it. So it, it's, it's like a video that teach them the intervention and then I measure uh, what they felt about it, what was helpful and so on. I hope it was a good enough example. Yeah, that's really great. I love, we're, we're kind of talking about a moment, like changing my interaction with my loved one for just a moment, right? And that brief intervention, I love how you and your example with the cab driver talked about how it made you feel, 
right? It does. It changes how we feel about one another in those moments. So thank you for that. Yes, this uh, next question is for Denise, but everyone feel free to answer as well. Um, so we were discussing the significance of self-care for families. Um, we have one question here from Brendan Norton. Um, if you could elaborate maybe on what types of things do you suggest families do for self-care? So certainly, uh, thank you, Amber. Um, I always like to spin it back, right? Um, that there's no one size fits all, right? Each family is different, right? Whether it's their work schedule, um, where they are on the touch point with that loved one, right? Because it really changes how we can do this. So, and again, if we think of this in, in a moment and bite size, um, where are we sitting? Um, so I'm gonna start simple, right? Um, we can go outside and take a walk um, and just give that space. Sometimes that self-care doesn't have to be addiction related. Um, I'm going to try to serve up examples for me as I haven't watched the news in two weeks, right? So, so my mental health space is better there to better help my loved ones or all my adult children back home, all right? Um, and some of it could be, you know, just reading a book. Um, it could be doing some meditation and some yoga. Um, I think, I, I hope that helps the simple steps. Um, so often, you know, what we hear is, is not achievable. It's like, you know, go out, have a good time, go away for the weekend and forget all this, impossible. Um, so as you think about that self-care, think about what you really can, you know, set the bar low so that you can achieve that self-care and then you can, you know, um, reimagine it every week and try some new things. Um, but there is no one size fits all. I think it's very individual and unique. Really true. I know so many um, people lean into mindfulness and they lean into meditation and they lean into apps like the Calm app, just little things that they can listen to, meditations or something throughout the day. And that works for some people and it doesn't for others. Um, so it's all about finding for you. There's no, like you said, right or wrong. It's, it's you individually, what works for you. And sometimes you don't know that until you give a lot of different things a try. And I would really encourage people to go to groups. I mean, there are online groups that we offer a free family online group um, every week and you can just go to it through our website. And um, it's moderated by a uh, certified uh, family recovery coach. So it's, it's not just, you know, um, uh, it, it's moderated for meaning and, and um, fairness. Um, and um, support groups, if, if you um, give Al-Anon a try and it's not a right fit, try a different Al-Anon meeting. There's so many different groups and they have different internal cultures um, and uh, treatment programs like Karen, Christine was talking about that offer support groups to families. It's a way of, and you don't even have to participate. You can be a fly on the wall, but you'll be amazed at how much you can relate to and how other people are going through this and they learn to talk about it without fear, without shame. And they explore the issues that feel guilt provoking, but then get honest and they realize, well, there are things I'm doing that I should be doing differently, but I don't have to feel terrible about that because everybody seems to have had to learn about it. So, um, you know, the groups for family members are really critical. Yeah, everyone's doing the best they can. And when you know more, you can do better, right? Yeah. Um, David, this one is specifically for you. This is from Anonymous. I always love that. Thank you, Anonymous. Uh, so um, they wanted to share thank you for this webinar um, and, and was asking kind of specifically about dynamic care. And I thought this was a really interesting question. And does dynamic care work with those in recovery who are on meds as part of their journey to sobriety and wellness? And if so, how is the med intake evaluated and monitored through your system? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so in general, programs are getting better at not only allowing people to be on meds, but realizing there is a role for meds. Um, being on meds and being abstinent is not being in recovery, but it can be a foundation for building a recovery. 
So in dynamic care, we take a, a very broad view of all the valuable tools. And we do two things with meds. Number one, we provide med reminders that can be scheduled, including the time of day, the dose, and monitoring the person taking their pills or their lozenge and showing the selfie video camera that they're doing this in real time, we watch that. So we see that it's them, they've got the right pill as they're supposed to, and they're taking it the right way. So that's accountability and reminding, which can be really hard for people who've been using drugs chronically. They, they lose their sense of time, they lose their sense of a schedule, they're used to responding to impulse. And all of a sudden some doctor is saying, you have to do this every day, you should do it at the same time, the best way to remember it. Well, it takes time to develop those skills in a recovering brain. The other thing we do is we test for drugs that you're supposed to be on. So if you're supposed to be on um, an ADHD medication, which is like a stimulant, but you have to test that differently from methamphetamine and cocaine. So we separate those in the testing. Um, buprenorphine is different from heroin. You can test for them separately. So um, they're, they're, we use a couple different methods that are objective, but we, again, put this in the hands of the patient. But by doing this on a daily basis and rewarding it and tracking it and providing the, the data to the loved one, the family member, we're doing what we talked about in this, in this uh, past hour and a half. We're giving frequent, easily achievable, day at a time uh, um, goals. And when they're achieved, we're providing that pat on the back, you did it, you're taking care of your illness. And we provide the validation to the loved one so that the trust is there with verification. And that just calms down the whole temperature of the worry, the angst, the fighting. And that decreases the potential of that relationship stress to provoke a relapse. Yeah, David, I, I like kind of, not only are we monitoring and helping kind of with just the consistency with medication management, but then also in the back end rewarding that um, behavior and kind of monitoring and tracking. I, I kind of like there's a wraparound element to that. Um, I am curious, and I'll kind of just go with uh, Chloe Wilkins' question, and I thought it was a pretty tough one, right? And, and throughout the panel, there have been um, some critiques on Al-Anon, right, which every program needs critiques and feedback. And um, Chloe was also kind of asking, though, for families in which this has been um, very helpful, how do you support the work of Al-Anon, especially with their core values of detaching with love? And I'll kind of leave it open for anybody who might have thoughts on that. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a first shot at that, Jack. Um, I think Al-Anon is a great resource, right? Um, a safe place to share, um, a place where you're amongst your peers and, and you don't feel alone, um, a place where you can learn so much about self-care. Um, but for many families, um, they need some solutions. And so, I always circle back and said, how do, how do we define letting go? What does that even mean, right? Again, that unique answer. Um, you know, I, a personal example of that is I have another son uh, without addiction who has a um, serious uh, medical condition. And I was never told to like, let go, right? Let go and give up hope. So, so again, it's unique to that family. It's how you define it for yourself um, and how, can I support this loved one with another medical condition? I think the other thing too, and sometimes with Al-Anon, and it'll, I'll cross over into our program, um, is that we hear often about the personal experience, and, and this is not about the program, but sometimes the people in the room, and you should do this, and you should do this, and you should do this, based on a personal experience, right? And so, what we try to do is not be those fixers, right? While our peer support, peer, peer support program is that lived experience, um, we're so aware that our experience is not their experience. So instead we you know, sit in it with them and help them problem solve what best works for their family. So I think um, 
I think Al-Anon, again, is a safe place to share. Um, and I just want to add one more thing. There's so many families today that hit so many barriers, lack of treatment, denial of insurance. Imagine the many different hats that they play and why solution-based models might work. So, so yes, I need my self-care, but I have to advocate for my child's health care, right? And push for that. And so that's not enabling, but advocating and learning the difference of codependency and enabling. And it's just uh, sitting in it with that family. And I think it's just uh, a great program. And I think so many other programs could just complement it. And you, there's that phrase, take what you want and leave the rest, right? What works best for your family. Beautifully said, Denise. Any, yeah, anybody else would like to kind of jump on that question? Hard to follow Denise after that one. Um, I know that we're just about at time and, and we just kind of want to share some resources. Um, Amber, did you have anything else that you wanted to add on the Q&A part? Um, yeah, I think we have time maybe for just one more question. Um, I see one here from Arian. Um, I believe the question is, um, I've been struggling to reach, connect with family and active existence addiction more than normal during COVID. So I think the question here is, how, how um, have you found expanding your outreach during this um, difficult time during this pandemic? Open to the floor to anybody. I, I'm not a <laughs> clinician and I don't work in that division of Karen, so I don't feel like I can speak very well to it other than to say we are aware of um, a much higher relapse rate during COVID um, than ever before and I think that um, you know families are, are back in it and it's terrifying and, and they're lost and some are more willing to reach out for help and support than others um, so I don't have a great answer for that but I, I am aware that you know families are <laughs> experiencing a lot right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've seen that too, and it's forced our coaches to become more intensive. Um, and, and your question is implying this, you know, people are cooped up more in small spaces and family members that might have been out during the day and when they went out in the evening drinking or whatever, um, it wasn't in the midst of the other person who's trying to manage their recovery. So, um, you know, we, we have seen people who are upset about something that's happening in the home or with the family member and are afraid to speak up about it lest it become a battle. Um, we have, our coaches have decided, well, we're trained in this. We will speak to them for you and initiate this conversation. And because they have that shared experience of being in, of having had an addiction, um, they feel able to do that. And the person they reach out to may be more receptive to hearing what does this guy have to say or this gal. So um, it does take you know, more effort in a, in a situation like this pandemic. Um, and you know, the numbers don't lie. We've got 42% increases in overdose rates, increased suicide um, rates. Uh, it, it's, it's an absolutely you know, stressful, you know, difficult time. Yeah, I, and, and Fred, I think you'll agree here since you're our technical guru, um, is we hear them. Um, we're seeing this day to day and, um, and we're expanding our programs. I talked about the online support groups being once a week and now four or five times a week and reaching, um, you know, through the week hundreds of families. And, and for that family to come in and know they can just sit there and observe right, and listen um, to not only the discussion, but what other families are going through, and, and they find that so relatable, so it's not just about me, wow, this whole group, we're all going through this together, um, and pull on each other's wisdom and techniques and tools, and um, so I think that's really great, and I think of um, our Help and Hope um, texting platform, right, um, just creating that COVID track. It was so desperately needed for the families um, that are struggling right now and, um, and, the, the, and the extra resources. So I think the silver lining here is, is that outreach and to be able to 
take what we have and scale it out um, so much more to reach more families. Um, so uh, I'm Thanks, really Jimmy. proud of that. Um, and, and thank you to everyone. Uh, you know, we have a few, uh, just, just a little bit over time. Um, I want to thank the partnership family, Amber, Jack, and Ara. Uh, we are a family, and that's why we do group moderation. Um, I want to thank the panelists, Christine, Denise, and Meet, and David, uh, for their brilliant insights. Uh, and this is tough. And, you know, when I think about what you've been mentioning, Denise, you mentioned that ability to scale. Everyone sort of mentioned that dive in at your own pace. Everyone's mentioning connection. People have mentioned peers specifically. People have mentioned asynchronous and synchronous communication, that it could be at three in the morning, that there could be just-in-time interventions. There could be micro-interventions. These are all things that families need. These are all things that we can leverage from a technological perspective to reach families where they are. You know, that, that, that um, opportunity to meet someone where they are and, and, and use technology to do that is we have the opportunity. Um, and for all the panelists, thank you so much. Uh, uh, excuse me, for all the attendees, thank you so much for joining. We will send out resources. We're going to ask each of the panelists for a resource list on family-based tech interventions. Um, and this is a growing and uh, field in its infancy. There's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. If we look at what's happening on the AI side and what's happening on the app side for individuals struggling and on the medical side, we're just getting started. So everyone here has the opportunity to build amazing interventions. Everyone here has the opportunity to help shape what this is going to look like. So I encourage you all to stay involved um, and we'll continue the back and forth for sure. Uh, before we finish, is there any anything anyone wants to say? Uh, people have the opportunity to go, all the, all the uh, attendees, if they want, as we're a little bit over time, just want to uh, open it up for anybody to say, you know, 10 seconds of a final word if you'd like. All right, then. Great Wonderful. Thank you. And we will follow up with resources. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all.